the words are familiar, no matter what translation you may have read, too familiar, I think, to summon the good response that they define. We've heard them, but not done them. Let me set these words in context. The first acts of Israel's third king, Solomon, were first to build his own palace, and then second, to build the temple. His father David could only dream of building the temple. He desired to do it, but God forbid him to do so. And forbidden by this gracious God, David commissioned his son Solomon to do it in his place. Now the palace and temple are completed, dedicated, celebrated, and when the celebration is over, that very night, Yahweh appeared to Solomon and spoke to him in the night. Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning at verse 12, we read, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple of sacrifice. It could end right there. That would have been a great statement for God to affirm the work that the people had done together. But there's more, and we do well to hear what else is, is to follow after these very affirming words. Yahweh spoke to Solomon and speaks to us today. Words that carry the freight of a profound biblical theology that is not so very popular in our day and time. Verse 13, if, no, not if, when, when I shut the sky so there is no rain, and when I command the grasshopper to consume the land, and if I send pestilence on my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Well, let me paraphrase the idea here. God says, when I bring trouble, both great and small, short-term, long-term, any kind of trouble whatsoever that I may bring. And my people pray with humility and repentance in response to the trouble that I bring to them. And my people pray with humility and repentance. I will hear their prayer. I will forgive their sin. And I will heal their land. One of the greatest promises in all of the Old Testament coming to us through one of the severest of experiences that we may have with God. Uh, now, I've never seen a virus, but I believe. I've only seen the effects of a virus from a mild infection to a severe illness or even uh, to death. But, and we're in a pandemic right now. The, the numbers are not improving much, if any, but we're getting out going back to work, going out to eat, going back to the mall. And some are saying, hooray for us, we're winning. Really? No, I mean, really, are we overcoming this pandemic on our own? We're doing good, but are we routing the plague by our own efforts alone? Or are there forces at work that we don't really understand. You see, I've never seen God, but I believe. I believe because I look around, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, the song says, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Paul writes to the Roman church in the very first chapter of his great book called the Letter to the Romans that all of creation bears witness to the invisible God, the power and the glory of the God that we cannot see. I have never seen God, but I believe because I see his creation and his effect on the world around him. He's not out there and silent and wringing his hands, wondering what we're going to do next. 
You see, the crises of human history have in every time and place always had two major components. One, they originate with God himself. The crises that come to humanity always pass through God's hand, always are subject to his will, always at the very least permitted by him. The Lord acted to accomplish his purposes in grace, to do his mysterious will, to assert his divine sovereignty, providence, authority. Words we're not as comfortable associating with God. We would rather see him in a different light. Second Chronicles 7, 13 says, when I shut the sky so there is no rain, and when I command the grasshopper to consume the land, and if I send pestilence on my people, the Lord takes responsibility for it all. The Lord acts according to his own character and nature. And you gotta be clear that God reveals not only that he is love, but he is also holy, that he is good and gracious and kind and compassionate, but he is also a God of wrath. And these two sides, these two parts of God's character and nature come together in the things that he does in our behalf, that he does in order to get our attention. It takes faith to believe for real comforting words, those very real comforting words found in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of those who love God who are the called according to his purpose. But the all things that work together for good are for those who love God and not for humanity in general. For those who love God who are the called according to his purposes. Now the crises of human history, one, originate with God himself, and two, call his people back to himself. And that's why calamity and hardship and difficulty often befalls us. That is why we often go through tough times so that God can teach us to depend upon himself and not upon our own selves. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, And my people who are called by my name upon them humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. You see, difficulty, hardship, threats to our life, the challenge to our existence, every kind of experience that passes through God's hand that we might term bad, difficult, painful, is meant to turn us back to him. He calls us to himself. The most stunning example of that is the very crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God used the most horrible thing to happen to the only perfect person who ever lived in all of human history to make it possible to save you and me. Jesus, the perfect Son of Man, Son of God, died on a cross, not for his own sins, but for the sins that you and I had committed so that he could show grace and kindness and good to, goodness to us. And yet we find ourselves in a circumstance where change is needed, where we must consider changing in a variety of ways. It is said that people will not change until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of changing. I think there's a little bit of truth in that if not a great deal of truth in that very thing. Uh, it is said that mental illness can be defined as continuing to do the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting different results. But you've found yourself doing that, haven't you? You've found yourself trying to do the same thing. I've recently, I feel kind of dumb about it, but I've been trying to recover an old email address. Um, it's been probably 10 years since I used that email address, and even though it has my name in it, 
I cannot prove to the owners of the of the service that I that I own that name, that I own that account. And so I cannot even get into my own account anymore. You know what I've done? Probably 20 times I've been through the same steps trying to get that thing to, to come to light again. It just has not happened. But I don't know of another thing in the world to do. So I feel frustrated that I cannot open my very own account by following the directions that I've had. Maybe I have to accept that I need a new email account that I can use. If we people of God have turned away from the truth of the gospel in some subtle way, if we have turned to another gospel that is not a gospel, as Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 1. However subtly we have done this, if we have tried to transform the gospel and make it suitable for today, for our time, for contemporary society, it may be that Jesus is using hardship and difficulty to call us back to himself, to call his church to come back to him. A middle-aged man took his family on a vacation and they were traveling around and going to some different places where the man had lived when he was, uh, when he was younger, just to show the, the family where he had been. His father was a pastor and he spent some time in a little town that uh, they came to at last in their journey. And as they were there the, uh, on a Sunday morning, the man and his son got out of the hotel early in the morning and took a walk. And he said, I want to show you the church that my dad once pastored, church where I grew up. And so they came around the corner and it was kind of heartbreaking to see what kind of shape the, the building was in. There's lots of peeling paint, not a single car in the, in the parking lot. It was clear that the church had fallen on, on some hard times. But the man said, well, let's see if we can go inside. I'd love for you to see it. And looked in a window and sure enough, it looked like all the pews were there. The pulpit was still up there and where it could be seen. And, and so they pushed on the door and sure enough, it was unlocked and it was ready to enter. And when the man and his son entered into the foyer, a whole flood of wonderful memories rushed over the man. And yet a sort of sadness because of what had become of what once was there. In the middle of the foyer hung a rope. Now you who have been around old country churches know what that rope is all about. He tugged on the rope just enough to feel the resistance and sure enough the old church bell was still attached to the other end of the rope. And uh, he said, Dad used to let me ring the bell. He said, You'd have to grab onto this rope with two hands and hold on tight because when you pull it down, it would recoil and pull you up off the ground. And he said, you want to try it? Now, it's not hard to imagine that the little boy, when he first tugged on that, on that rope and felt the pull of the bell pulling him up off of the, off of the, off of the floor, uh, that he just had a wonderful time. And sure enough, he just rung the bell and kept ringing the bell. And before long, it's not hard to imagine why curious people would come from all over the neighborhood responding to the bell, the ringing of a church bell they had not heard in so long, as if summoned, as if a familiar call long forgotten from their past was, was ringing into the present moment. Well, dear friends, God has not changed. And the gospel has not changed. Is God through trouble, through coronavirus, through financial hardship, through difficulty and pain, not because he's a God of wrath, but because he's a God of mercy and grace? Is he possibly calling us to prayer with humility and repentance? so that he can renew and revive and restore his church to what it once was. 
I have a feeling there's more truth in the question that I'm posing even now. Some of you remember a time when things were very different in our churches. Some of you remember what it was like to speak of loving the Lord and of serving him and of making him the priority in all of, all of life. But as 2 Chronicles 7 says, when he shuts the sky so there is no rain, and when he commands the grasshopper to consume the land, and if he sends pestilence on his people, and his people who are called by his name, humble themselves, pray and seek his face, and turn from their evil ways, will he not hear from heaven, forgive our sin? and heal our land. I said, the words are familiar to us. We understand what they mean, but we've not done them. I think we have not done this thing that God has called us to do. When is now? Today, our time all the world time. Time to humble ourselves, pray, seek his face, and turn from our evil ways that he may renew, revive, and restore us. Let us pray. Our Father, Times are not easy for us to go through right now. Difficulty and hardship is the name of the game. And we're all reeling from the changes that are occurring and anticipating that there will never be the same old thing that once was. There's going to be a brand new reality for us. But it's good. If we have given our attention to you, as you have called us to do, and if we are turning our lives over to you in a fresh new way, and if we are yielding ourselves to you for whatever good purpose you may want to use us for, then you have accomplished your great good in our lives, and we will be ever grateful for it. We'll look back and we'll say it was good for us to go through such hardship that we might come again into your good grace and mercy. So work your will. Do the tough stuff. And your people who are called by your name will pray. Seek your face. Turn from our evil ways. And you will heal our land. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.